Good morning, Metro. My name is Clayton. I am the pastor of the high school group here, in case you guys are new here. Um, but if we could just open up with a word of prayer, if you would just bow your heads with me. God, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you, God, that we can come before you here in this place with brothers and sisters as a community to worship you, God. Worship does not end with the music or the praise, but we want to worship you right now, God, even as we listen to your word, as we fall, Father, at your feet. I pray, God, that your word would be beautiful to us. I pray, Father, that your word would be true and real in our lives. I pray, God, that as we spend time, God, just digging through your word, we would hear your voice. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and flood this room? God, we invite you to this place. May you move in us. May you change us. May you transform us. May you work in our hearts right now with whatever we're going through, God. You know us. You know what we're going through. You know every one of our needs. And we know that you are a faithful God. And so would you provide, God, what we need today? If it's encouragement, would you encourage? If it's rebuke, would you rebuke? We just ask, Lord, that your presence would be here in this place. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Testimonies are powerful. I can't wait till the Zamele mission trip comes back and they share these amazing stories with us. But I love testimonies. We have, they are encouraging and they are convicting. And there's a certain type of testimony that I love to hear. I love hearing stories of dramatic transformations. Maybe it's a story of addiction where someone encountered Jesus and Jesus freed them from the thing that, it, that, they, that enslaved them or that they were addicted to. Maybe it was a story of a miraculous healing and God had healed somebody from a chronic illness leading them to give their life to Jesus. I used to envy people with these types of salvation stories. My story of salvation isn't flashy, it's not shocking. I didn't struggle with drugs, sex, or I didn't need healing. My salvation story is actually quite boring. I was never the rebellious type. And so when I was younger, I used to think, maybe I should sin some more, right? Maybe I should get into more trouble so that my testimony could be powerful. Right, that's how immature I was back then. We all have a story to share, but why is it that we're so drawn into the, to the dramatic and exciting? In the Bible, we love hearing about the woman at the well who was living an adulterous life until she met Jesus and becomes one of the greatest evangelists. Or Paul, he lived in sin persecuting Christians until he met Jesus and became the most prominent missionary in history. We don't say we want to be like Boaz, Right? Some of you guys don't even know who Boaz is. That's how forgettable his story is. We love the dramatic. We love hearing testimonies of transformation. And I believe the reason why we love these stories so much is because we are enamored with the extraordinary. This is why we gravitate towards grand gestures and big spectacles. But God doesn't always work in the realm of the extraordinary. God doesn't only perform miracles. More often than not, God works in the ordinary. Yes, God can show up in a fire, he can show up in an earthquake, but he also comes as a gentle whisper. We all desire those earth-shattering revelations of God, but what if God was revealing himself to us, but we were missing out on it? Because we weren't looking for God in the ordinary. We're looking at for God in these grand displays. As we continue in our sermon series on the acts of the Holy Spirit today, I want to take a look at what does it mean for God to work in the ordinary? What does it mean for us to understand and experience God's providence daily in our lives? So if you have your Bibles with you, could you please turn to Acts chapter 23 with me? And we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 23, verse 12 through 35. So starting with verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. 
Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it that you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man, and with this warning, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Verse 23, then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to the Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. People fast for many reasons. We fast for spiritual renewal. We fast to hear God's voice. We, we fast so that we can know our dependence on God. But here in this passage, a group of Jews fasted for the murder of Paul. We find that more than 40 Jews have taken this oath not to eat or drink until they have seen Paul killed. Can you imagine how much they must have hated and despised Paul to take this oath? It's one thing to plot against somebody. It's in taking it to another level. When you take an oath before God to starve yourself, to see the person you despise and hate dead. The plan was to have the commander bring out Paul for questioning and ambush him when he shows up. The stage was set. All the characters were in play, but they didn't account for one thing, and that was God. God intervenes to save Paul. It wasn't by any extraordinary measure. Paul is saved through ordinary means. God used the willingness and the availability of people to save Paul. There is nothing spectacular about Paul's nephew. In fact, he is so unspectacular, we don't even know his name. And even the commander, Claudius Lysias, he isn't special. He may have had authority as a commander, but he is mostly known for being the one who almost broke the law by beating Paul, a Roman citizen. God isn't mentioned once in this passage, and yet we know and believe that it's God orchestrating this rescue mission. God works behind the scenes to save Paul's life. And we call this God's providence. God's providence. God's providence is defined as God providing for our needs through natural means, right? Don't mistake that for a miracle. Providence is God providing for our needs through natural means. 
A miracle is God working outside of the natural law. For example, wine is produced by grapes through a natural process called fermentation, uh, designed and controlled by God. It's God's providence. Jesus turning water into wine was a miracle. It was extraordinary. It was outside of God's ordered plan. Within this passage, we see that God's providence is at work. We see God's fingerprints all over the story. God made sure that the nephew was in the right place at the right time to overhear the plot. God gives Paul favor from the commander so that the commander sends him out with the 400 soldiers. And even when he gets to Caesarea and sees Governor Felix, he is deemed innocent. Just because we can't see God in the midst of what we're going through does not mean that he isn't there. It just means that God is working behind the scenes. Oftentimes, the mistake that we make when it comes to providence is thinking that it shields us from all suffering and pain. We believe that God is, if God is truly with us and for us, then we should never be suffering. We should never face hardship. We believe that God's providence is mutually exclusive from suffering, that the two can exist at the same time. And because of that, when we do struggle, we start to question if God really is good or if he's really that powerful. We struggle with this question, why? Why am I going through this? Why is God allowing me to go through this in this moment? Why isn't God answering my prayers? How many of you have been disappointed by God because he didn't answer your prayers? You ask God to heal you or a loved one of their sickness, and yet God didn't heal. You ask God to fix a broken relationship, and yet there hasn't been any movement towards reconciliation. You ask God to reveal himself powerfully in your life, to draw you nearer to him, and yet you still feel so distant from God. You ask God to help you get that promotion, but yet, once again, you've been looked over. Or maybe you ask God to help you find a spouse, and yet you still remain single. It's important that we understand that God's providence in our lives does not mean that we won't suffer, nor does it mean that God will give us everything that we want and pray for. What God does promise is that he's working out his purposes for your life. What if God allowed you to go through that hardship or didn't answer your prayer because he wanted to mature you? He wanted to build grit in you. He wanted to grow you. Oftentimes, it's in difficult situations where we grow the most. Can we trust that God knows what he's doing and his will for our life is the best? Can we trust that God knows what he's doing and trust that his will for our life is the best? We may not be able to answer the question of why we suffer to our satisfaction, but we have the assurance of the goodness of God displayed on the cross. When we look at Jesus' sacrifice, we see that God made the ultimate sacrifice for our sake. Jesus willingly suffered so that we wouldn't have to suffer for our sins. Jesus did not suffer in vain. Out of the bad, God brought beauty. God knows what we need before we need it. God gave up his son to be the answer for our sins. If he didn't withhold his son from us, we should be confident that he will not hold anything from us. God always provides for our needs. We just need to have the eyes to be able to see it. And so how do we see God's providence in our life? How do we see God's providence? The first way is God's providence is revealed through his promises, through his promises. God made a promise to Paul, and that promise is made in verse 11. We didn't read verse 11. That was actually part of Pastor Doug's sermon a couple of weeks ago. But in verse 11, before the passage that we read, God said to Paul, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. God makes a promise to Paul, and he prepares him for that promise. 
The promise is that Paul will make it to Rome. But what I love about this is that he starts off with the words, take courage. Take courage. This is how amazing and wise our God is. He knows every angle. He sees every twist and turn. He knows that the road to Rome will be difficult. He knows every bump that they will face. And so he wants to encourage Paul with the words, take courage. Those words, take courage, take on real meaning in Paul's life when his life is threatened. God has just promised Paul that Jerusalem was not his final destination. God had a mission and purpose for Paul, and that mission was for him to testify and proclaim the, new, the good news of Jesus in Rome. And what do we see? God keeps his promise. God keeps his promise. Paul does get to Rome, but it probably wasn't the way that Paul expected. Paul probably thought that he would continue on this missionary journey with his companions and his friends, that he would go to Rome and proclaim to this multitude of people the good news of Jesus, but that didn't happen. God had another plan for him. God used the deceit and evil of men plotting against his life to fulfill his promise to Paul. The plot against his life was a catalyst but it was God moving in the background to make sure that Paul gets to Caesarea and then to Rome safely. God used the deceit and evil of men to accomplish his purpose. There might be a time where you face a similar situation as Paul. It might not be that your life is on the line, but there might be a time when people speak ill of you. There might be a time where people want to bring you down. There might be a time where people discourage you there might be a time where, you're, where people just gossip about you. But it's during these moments where you can trust that God does have your back. God knows what he's doing and he has your well-being in mind. God can and use, God can and will use all things to accomplish his will in your life, even the pain and the struggle. God's will for Paul's life was to have him speak to the highest level of Roman society. Paul didn't go to Rome as a missionary. He went as a prisoner. And as a prisoner, he was able to speak to the Roman officials. If he had gone on a missionary journey with his friends, he probably wouldn't have had an audience with Governor Felix. But God knew that. And so he sent Paul as his prisoner so that he can speak the good news of Jesus to Governor Felix. You've heard it said that God works in mysterious ways, and it's true, God's ways are mysterious to us because we lack the imagination and creativity to see things through God's eyes. But God's ways are not mysterious to him. He sees every possibility. His plans for us may not make sense in that moment, but he has a purpose in what he's doing. When I was younger, I dreamed of getting married uh, and having a family at a young age. Like, I always thought I was pretty mature. And so my plan was, I'm going to get married at 25. I'm not sure who it was, but 25 was the age. And then I would have a kid at 26. <laughs> As you can see, God did not answer that prayer or did not answer that plan because I didn't get married until I was 31. And I didn't get, and then I have Weston until I was 34. And so in those years, in those lonely years before I got married, I used to question God. I'm like, God, what is your plan for me? You told me that you have a plan to prosper me, not to harm me. So what's taking so long? And I look back and I am so thankful to God that he didn't follow through on my plan for my own life. Because God was, had a different plan for me. God had a better plan for me. He used those, that time where I was not married, where I was single, just to prepare me for Esther and Wes. He knew that I had a lot of growing up to do, even though I didn't know that. Amen. God did the very best thing for me by allowing me to wait and become the best husband and wife that I can be for Wes and Esther. That was God's plan of prosperity for me. Not to give me what I wanted, but to prepare me for the future. God keeps his promises. God is not a liar, he is a truth teller. He is consistent and he is trustworthy. When God gives us a promise, he will follow through on it. He has never failed us. We see his providence through the many promises that he makes to us. 
God promised comfort in our trials. He, com- he promised rest for those who are weary. He promised a plan for our lives, a plan to prosper us, not to harm us. He promised to always be with us, to never leave us nor forsake us. The promises of God are too numerous to count, but he will follow through on every single one of them. And where do we find his promises? It's in his word, the Bible. We have to read and study the word of God because if we don't, then we won't know these promises of God. And if we don't know the promises of God, we won't be able to see how God works in our lives. It's so important that we become students of the word. God's providence is revealed through his promises. But the second way that God's providence is revealed is through his peace, through his peace. There is a peace that overcomes us when we place our trust in God. Whenever Paul's life is threatened, we see that there's a peace that resides in him. He is never worried about his own life. In fact, it's usually his friends, those who are accompanying him, who usher him away from danger. To get a sense of what Paul is thinking and feeling, we can look at his writings during these dangerous times. He wrote the letter of uh, Philippians when he was imprisoned. And in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, he writes, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote this during dangerous times. Does that sound like someone who's worried or scared? God provides his peace to those who trust in him. Paul understood the goodness of God. He understood the promises that God had for him. He had no doubt that God was gonna provide and so in faith, he places his trust in God. I think one of the reasons why we lack peace is because we place more trust in ourselves than we do on God. We like to be in control, and when we're not in control, we start to become anxious and worried. If we were in Paul's situation, we'd probably be freaking out, trying to figure out, how do I get out of this situation? How do I save my own life? But that's not what Paul does. There is a peace that resides in him. And he entrusts his life ultimately to God by allowing God to provide through the assistance of others. Paul places a lot of faith in God and trusting his nephew and the commander, Claudius Lysias, to protect him. He didn't know how the commander would react or respond. The commander could have easily just dismissed Paul's nephew and said, hey, that's just rumor. I'm not gonna deal with it. Or he could have been like, This is not worth my time and effort. In fact, it probably made more sense for the commander actually to give up Paul to his conspirators because the Jews had a history of rioting and who knows, maybe they would have rioted. How many times, how many of us have the type of faith that Paul displayed in trusting in God? Do we have peace in all circumstances? Do we have peace when we're not in control? Do we have peace when things don't go our way? It's God who gives us the peace that surpasses all understanding, but you have to want it and ask for it. Giving God control over your life doesn't mean that you do nothing. It means that you do everything that you can and leave the rest for God to do what only he can do. Giving God control means living in obedience to him. It's believing and trusting that his ways are better than my ways. When we obey God, we are declaring that our life is in his hands. And who better to have our life in than a powerful, mighty, merciful God? Many of you aren't living with peace because you're still trying to maintain control over your life. When you're faced with an impossible situation or hardship, You panic and scramble to fix it on your own rather than to give it to God and consult God first. If you want to experience true peace in your life, you have to give control to him. God says, be still and know that I am God. And one of the best ways for us to be still is to be silent with him. 
to go to him, to spend time with him in silence. When it comes to spending time with God, we like to be in control of the conversation. We have this grocery list of all these things that we want God to take care of in our lives. But when we could go to him in silence, to spend time with him in silence, we allow God to be in control. We need to give God the space to speak to us because there's so many other distractions that keep us from hearing his voice. When you can center your life on God by being silent before him, then you can understand that the God who sustains the universe is also, one, also gonna be the one who sustains my life. Right, if God, the creator of this world, sustains the universe, our peace comes from understanding that he is the one who is, who is protecting and watching over us. When we place our trust and faith in Jesus, God's providence is revealed as he fills us with his peace. We can experience God's providence today. It's through his promises, through his peace, and the last way is through his perspective. God reveals his providence through his perspective. To be able to see God's providence in our lives, we need to have a different perspective. Oftentimes, we're short-sighted. We are people of instant gratification. We want answers immediately. We don't know how to wait. All of our focus is on what's in front of us, and that leaves us short-sighted in seeing how God is working behind the scenes. I don't know how long it took Paul to see God's providence in his life in this moment, but as readers of this text, we have a different perspective. We have the perspective to look at the situation and see what came out of it. We know that Paul's life was threatened and yet somehow, some way, through the actions of others, Paul's life is spared. Sometimes it takes having another perspective to be able to see the hand of God at work. When we're in the midst of something, it's hard for us to be able to see anything except our circumstances. When we're too close to a situation or if our emotions are running hot, all we can focus on is how we feel. For instance, when I'm in an argument with my wife, I'm not thinking, where's God in this situation? All I'm thinking about is how I feel. I'm angry, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed. I'm not thinking, where is God here? All I'm thinking is how Esther has wronged me. And a lot of times I've wronged her. (laughs) But in that moment, all I can think of is my pain. And because of that, I don't know where God is. I just want to win the argument. I'm not Christ-like to her. I'm like, where are you, God? It's only after an argument is done and some time has passed where I can look back and I can see God's hand at work in that argument. I can see the ways that Esther offered an olive branch to end the argument, the times where I refused to take that olive branch. I can see after some time that the fight may have been bad, but what came out of it was good, that it actually drew us closer to one another. But in that moment, immediately after, I'm not seeing that. It takes time. Time can provide great perspective, but another way, another way where we can gain fresh perspective is by processing and speaking with others. People can give us a new way to look at a situation. I have people that I regularly go to to give me perspective. Anytime I'm thinking through something or about to make a decision, or even if I'm processing what's happening in my life, I'll go to them and they'll give me insight about how God may be working in me or what God might be telling them, through, telling them to, for me. People are a great way of having a different perspective. And it's not just with situations that are happening in the present, it's important that we also process the past, the things that have happened in our past. Taking time to process the events in your life allows you to see God working in your life. We're quick to move on without processing the things that happen. It's easier for us to move on than to address and reflect on the painful memories. We rather numb ourselves so that we don't have to relive the pain than to process what happened and allow God to heal us. God wants to heal you. God wants 
to rid you of your shame. God wants to, to, God wants to lift you up from your disappointments. Will you let him enter into those painful memories and breathe new life into you? By looking back at your hurts and hardships and asking the question, God, where were you in this moment? What you'll discover is that God was always there. God was the one giving you the strength to endure that time. You are here because of God. You are here because of his strength. You are here because of his grace. You are here because of his mercy. You are here because he was there providing for your needs. For me, fatherhood has been one of the greatest blessings, but there have been times where I didn't know how I was gonna make it. My son, Weston, in general, he is great. My wife and I always say that he's an easy baby. He's a very happy baby, so he laughs a lot, he smiles a lot. He eats really well, like he eats really, really well. Like he's 11 months old, but he wears clothes that are 2T. And I actually blame myself. I blame myself because he's got daddy's thunder thighs. And so even right now, it's so hard for us to find pants that just fit over his thighs. He is a happy baby. He is an easy baby, but he wasn't always like that. Early on, well, my wife and I say that he's got extreme FOMO. He's got extreme fear of missing out. And the way that he shows is because early on, he was a terrible sleeper. The moment that he was born, he was just a bad sleeper. And so there's one time where he woke up in the middle of the night, like all newborns do. My wife fed him, and then I was put in charge of burping him and then putting him back to sleep. And so I was trying to put him back to sleep after I had burped him. I was sitting in the rocking chair, swaying back and forth. I stood up and rocked him in my arms. I started singing to him his favorite song, Jesus Loves Me. I even went to YouTube and I was like, how do you get a baby to sleep? (laughs) And after 45 minutes, I just got frustrated and angry. And so I'm angry and I'm mad. And so I start squeezing him really tight. And I start gritting my teeth. I'm like, just go to sleep. Just listen, go to sleep. I know you're cranky and tired. Why won't you just go to sleep? And because I was so frustrated and angry, I knew I had to get away. And so I just left them into the crib crying. And I went to the living room. And I just sat there in the living room on my couch. And I was feeling terrible about myself. I was feeling like I was a terrible father. And in that moment, God gave me a revelation. He said, this is unconditional love. This is unconditional love. Like I knew the promise that God had made to me. I knew that God said that he would love me unconditionally, but that night, that took on new meaning. I understood what unconditional love is, the depths of it, because I knew that no matter how annoyed and frustrated I would get at Weston, I will always deep down inside love him. And so that promise of God of loving me unconditionally had a deeper meaning that night. And as I sat there reflecting on this truth, God just gave me this sense of peace. And I know it's a sense of peace because nothing in the situation had changed. Wes was still in his crib, crying and awake. The situation didn't change, but the way I looked at the situation had changed. And so I knew that I needed to make it right with Wes. And so I went back into his room, I leaned over his crib, and I just said, Daddy loves you. I'm so sorry for what I've done. Can you please forgive me? Right? That night, God was present. God was with me, and it wasn't in any extraordinary way. God simply reminded me of his promise. He gave me his peace, but it took some perspective to be able to see how God was working in that moment. God is good. He reveals his providence to us each and every day. You don't have to wait for him to perform a miracle for you to encounter him. God works in the ordinary. Metro, my prayer today is that we would have the eyes to see God working in our lives through his promises, through his peace, and having a different perspective. That's what's going to give us the strength to endure every situation and circumstance that we face. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your goodness displayed to us each and every day. We confess to you, God, that sometimes we don't 
have the eyes, or we didn't have the eyes to be able to see, Father, how you are working in our lives. Sometimes we look for the grand, we look for these spectacles, we look for the extraordinary, when God, you have always been there with us. I pray, God, that even in those times where we couldn't see you, that we would have the faith to know and to believe and trust that you are working in our lives and that you have a different purpose, a better purpose, God, than the, than the one that we have for ourselves. So I thank you, God, for being a God that continues to work in our lives, that continues to show us, Father, your faithfulness. I pray, God, for, I pray that we would be, God, people who are students of your word, that we would know, Father, your grand promises to us, that we would know, Father, that you, the promises that you make, that you will fulfill. I pray, Father, for just greater trust in you. It's so hard, Father, to give up control. It's so hard for us not to know what's gonna happen next. But God, if you gave up your son, Jesus, to be the ultimate sacrifice for us, we can trust that you would not withhold anything from us. And so we place our trust in you. We place our lives in you. We pray that, God, you would have your way in us. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for what you are doing, even in this moment, God. We know that you are present and you are working. Give us the eyes to see you and to respond with worship and praise. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you guys could take out the communication cards, or if you have the app, you'll find the communication card on the app. There's a couple of next steps that I'd like to go over with you. The first, I'm committing my life to Jesus for the first time. If that's you, just know that the angels in heaven are rejoicing with the decision that you made to give up your life to Jesus. And if that's you, can I just encourage you, there's a table uh, through those doors called the next table. There'll be a pastor there just to help answer any questions that you may have, but also give you some resources in this decision that you've made. The second, I will spend time in silence and solitude once a day. Pastor Peter wrote this great blog post about how we need to pray to the face of God because oftentimes we are praying to the hands of God. Sometimes we are all, in our prayer life, we're all about God do this and that for me when God wants us just to be present with him. Okay. So can I encourage you, maybe this is the decision you're gonna make today, to spend time in silence and solitude once a day with him this week. Third, I will meet up with a trusted friend to process a painful memory from the past. If you have a painful memory that you're going through or a painful time that you know that you haven't healed from, may you find healing through meeting with another person, just processing that, seeing how God was with you even at that time and God continues to be with you even this time. And the last, I will volunteer for one of the student ministries. All of our student ministries from the youngest, um, from the nursery to also the high school, we're in need of volunteers. And so can I just encourage you and ask, on? You know, as a person part of the student ministry, as a high school pastor, um, we can't do what we want to or what God wants us to do without volunteers. So can I just encourage you, if you have the time and the availability, sign up to volunteer uh, in the student ministry.